Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. Dr. James Kowal, Ph.D., is a board-certified neurotherapist, a member and presenter at the International Society of Neurofeedback and Research, board-certified expert of traumatic stress, approved consultant in clinical hypnosis, approved consultant in EMDR, a certified sex therapist, certified thought field diagnostic therapist, and an approved trainer for the Callahan Techniques. Dr. James Kowal and the staff at Life Worth Living make use of technological advances in neurotherapy to help people overcome difficulties associated with anxiety, depression, Asperger's, autism, attention deficit, traumatic brain injuries, concussions, migraine pain, obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviors, mood disorders, post-traumatic stress, memory problems, learning disabilities, and cognitive problems. In addition to being board certified in neurotherapy, members of Life Worth Living are also board certified experts in traumatic stress. They use innovative trauma methods such as EMDR, holographic memory resolution, thought field therapy, emotional freedom technique, clinical hypnosis, heart math, and other methods in the treatment of post-traumatic stress. Their office is located on the north side of Naperville, Illinois, near I-88, in the western suburbs of Chicago. They are in network with most mental health insurance companies and Medicare. They offer a free information seminar held on the first day of every month at 7 p.m. at the Ruha Center at 1110 North Washington Street, Naperville, Illinois. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And um, I'm excited to hear a um, whole different aspect of the work you do. Um, uh, I'm a psychologist. You're a psychologist. But you're a lot more than that with the work you do with the QEEG neurofeedback. So um, how did you get into this work? Well, this is a second career for me. I was originally a mathematician and a systems engineer and the head of systems engineering group for Bell Laboratories. I worked there 30 years. I planned a retirement to overlap my career in psychology. And I went back to school, got a second master's degree in counseling psychology and became a trauma therapist. I did that like a ministry. I worked two evenings and weekends out of a local church, and I helped people who were traumatized, who were abused. And that went on for four years until 1999, because at that time, I had 30 years service at Bell Laboratories. So I decided to take a, a full pension because I had 30 years service, and Dr. Dramer and I, was also a clinical psychologist and a trauma specialist, began the Center for Traumatic Stress. We got that up and running in 2000. And I said, if I'm going to do this full time, I'm going to go back and get my doctor's degree. So I went back to school to get a doctorate in clinical psychology. And while I was doing my residency on the campus of Indiana University, a doctor came and showed us QEEGs. And I was taken in by that. You could see everything in the brain. You could see depression, anxiety, ADD, OCD. This was fantastic. It enabled me to combine 30 years of my computer knowledge with 10 years of psychology. So I was all excited. I came back. I was on the staff at Linden Oaks Hospital, which is our mental hospital here in Naperville. 
And I had friends who were psychiatrists and I showed them what we found during my residency. And I was all excited and said, do you guys do this? Do you see what you can see inside the brain? And they said, no, no, we don't do any of that. And I said, why don't you do that? And they said, oh, because that's neurology. I said, neurology? Don't you guys think the brain has anything to do with behavior? Come to find out, that's true. Dan Amen, who's the head of the Amen Clinics, he has eight of them throughout the country. He is a psychiatrist, but he does QEGs, spec scans, digital analysis, even before he ever treats a patient. And he told me psychiatry is the only field of medicine that does not study the organ they treat. They don't look at the brain. Well, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I don't have to follow that model. And I began incorporating QEEG brain maps so that I could see what was really going on and what was behind the symptoms people were feeling and, and experiencing. Later, I could use the QEEG as differential diagnoses because people come in with a set of symptoms and they get classified, whether it be ADD or some other um, set of symptoms. And if you look at the brain, sometimes it confirms that and other times it shows that something else is going on, producing the same symptoms. But if you don't look at the brain, You'll never know. Wonderful. I'm familiar with Dr. Amen, and I love what he talks about how it's it's seemingly ridiculous to him that psychiatrists refuse to look at the brain scans, and that makes them the only physician that refuse to look at the organ they're treating. What happened with Dr. Amen is he was actually attacked for using what his colleagues thought should have remained research material in a clinical setting. Have you gotten any pushback like that? Well, the pushback that we get is from insurance companies. They say all of this is experimental. If they classify it as experimental, they do not have to reimburse for those kind of services. However, uh, the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research has underway a number of studies that are double blind studies that are very high quality and have a large number of uh, participants. And they are now showing that using a QEEG, we can both differentially diagnose with additional information much more accurately, and we can treat much more effectively. And I'm going to Denver next month, or this month, that's going to be in uh, two weeks, uh, to hear more about the findings of these studies that are, some of them are still underway. Neurologists are starting to begin to use QEEGs and neurofeedback as an alternative way of treating. They have uh, pointed out that we do not have an effective uh, set of procedure codes for neurofeedback. It's more than biofeedback. It changes the brain, much like neurofeedback changes the brain. However, it does not, um, uh, it is not a um, uh, type of uh, procedure that qualifies for therapy, psychotherapy, in fact. But we change the brain very much the same way. So they've asked the committee to come up with a, a new codes. And by the way, those codes have to be reimbursed at a higher rate because we use very expensive equipment to do this type of both uh, gathering information for diagnoses and for treatment. So with the help of neurologists, I see that this is going to begin to change. So you've mentioned two different things here. One of them is the assessment or the diagnosis, the getting a clear picture of what's actually happening. 
And then the other part is the treatment. So what kinds of things can you assess and what kinds of things can you treat with the QEEG okay. neurofeedback? All right. Well, let me uh, show you how we use QEEGs for differential diagnoses. And I believe we can share uh, my screen so that you can see uh, what we have here. There Wonderful. We go. I see it. And, uh, okay. The advantage that we have that, in fact, Dan Amon did not have when he began, was that we have a normative uh, lifespan database to compare to. When we collect data on a, on a patient, we can compare that data by gender, age, and handedness and see how they fall in a normal distribution so that certain frequencies at certain locations can be over or under active. We have since then correlated those findings with symptoms that people have uh, experienced. If we were to compare, we, as you see there, there are 19 locations that we can record data from. If we take the data found and go to the database and a person is within one standard deviation from the mean, which is the norm for the population, it would be green, shades of green, as you see there. If they move up to uh, one, two standard deviations from the mean, it changes to yellow and light orange. On the back side, two standard deviations below the mean, it changes to turquoise and light blue. If you go three standard deviations from the mean, you'll get into a dark orange and a red if you're too high, and a medium blue, a dark blue, if it's too low. So with this, we can find the areas of the brain which are over or under performing for specific frequencies. Next, we look at various kinds of disorders. This is an example of ADD. ADD there's two components to it. On the left, you see a, a child, late teen and adult, the amount of theta, a slow brain wave, four to eight hertz. And the reason it's listed that way is because it moves. A young child would be in the back of the brain. Someone, as they move into their teens, gets closer to the center. Someone around 18, 19, 20 years old will be directly in the center of the brain. And later, older adults, it will move towards the front of the brain. That is a measurement of how much theta their brain's producing. Now, to maintain attention, you have to have a low amount of slow activity. Another measure is how much good beta you have. Beta that assimilates information and makes it meaningful to you. That is typically between 12 and 17, 18 hertz. And as you see there, people who have ADD, they lack that type of beta activity. So you have too much theta and not enough beta. Moving forward, the man I studied with was Dr. Joel Lubar, probably the, one of the top neurotherapists in the country. He discovered that if you take a ratio between theta and beta and you plot it over the surface of the, the brain image here, you will always find a hot spot. And if that hot spot is greater than three, the person has ADD. In this case, their theta is very high, it's red, and the beta is in the blue area. They don't have enough. So if you ask the computer, this chart shows a very high concentration of slow activity, which is theta, four to eight hertz, and a lack of good beta to assimilate information. So if your brain is running excessively slow and you cannot assimilate the information, 
you are certainly not going to pay attention to it. If uh, my mentor, who was Joel Lubar, discovered that if you ask the computer to form a theta-beta ratio, you will always get a hot spot as indicated there. And if that spot is over three, it confirms the diagnosis of ADD. That has recently been accepted by the American Academy of Neurology with independent testing and found to be 94% accurate in designating ADD. So I get a number of patients here that come because they don't want to take medication or they want to get off of medication for ADD. The first thing I do is a QEEG. And if that ratio, as in this case, came out to 11.0, it confirmed they have ADD. And I get a lot of information then of how to treat that, how to lower the theta and bring up the beta. And that's what we do with neurofeedback. However, in another case, this boy came in and was to uh, told me that they diagnosed him as having ADD. I did a QEEG and found his theta-beta ratio was 1.13. This does not confirm ADD. So why isn't he paying attention? If you look at the chart on the right, you see alpha, which is a slow brain wave. It's very high in the front part of the brain, particularly in the left frontal area, which is where we think it's executive functioning area. And it's running very slow. This is the characteristics of a learning disability. This patient does not have ADD. He has a learning disability. You treat that differently. Another case came in and said they had ADD, been taking medication for a couple of years, and it hasn't been helping. I do a QEEG and I find their theta-beta ratio is 1.07. They do not qualify for ADD. Well, why isn't he paying attention? We looked to see if he had a learning disability, and he did not. Well, by this time, parents are saying, well, why isn't he, why does all his teachers say he has ADD? And I said, take a look at this left side of it. At the first upper left-hand corner, you see both sides of the brain are equally active. However, one hurts faster. The right side dominates the left. If you go one more hurt, faster, the left dominates the right. If you go one more hertz faster, the right dominates the left and so on. That is the hallmark of an absent seizure. This brain is seizing. It's an epileptic form activity. And while that's going on, the child just stares. He freezes and stares. And people will call his name and try to get his attention. And he can't break away because his brain is literally fighting the two hemispheres across each other. You treat that differently than by giving him a stimulant. One more case was a boy who came in. He had very good grades, except everyone complained he wasn't paying attention. He had ADD. They tried giving him medication. And after one dose, the father went back to the psychiatrist and says, you got to get him off of this stuff. We can't handle him. We got to scrape him off the ceiling. He's so hyper. So I take a look at his QEEG and his theta-beta ratio is 1.8. That's nearly perfect. He does not have ADD. The father says, well, what else could it be? Well, you see, he has normal low frequencies. They're all green. He does not have a learning disability. Okay, did we check for seizures? Well, 
there's his brain activity. And although it's a little higher on the left than on the right, he does not have absent seizure indications. Well, then by this time, the father says, well, why have for four years, all of his teachers said he has ADD? I said, take a look at this. This is good beta from 12 to 18 hertz. It is highly active. This brain is running four times faster than any of his peers because this data is normed by gender, age, and handedness. I says, this child is bored. His brain is running too, so fast that he's got it so he doesn't have to pay attention anymore. And his mother sat, sat up and says, wait a minute, that's what his fourth grade teacher said. And she claimed that she proved it by giving him permission to get out of his seat and go around the class and do anything he wishes while she was teaching because she learned that if she ever called on him, he would turn around and he would give her the answer. That's how he was absorbing information. He did not have to sit and make eye contact with you in order to acquire the information. So that is the kind of thing that we use QEEGs for. You would treat this totally different. You can see that if you gave this young boy a stimulant and you increased his beta activity, you'd scrape him off the ceiling. He, you would not be able to live with him. His brain would be like on fire. And that's what they experienced. So if you, Dan Amen was right. If you don't look at the brain, you will never know. And you will mistreat based on symptoms and pencil and paper types of tests. So that's what we do. And this is only one example of one uh, disorder that we can effectively accumulate much more detailed information of how the brain is functioning for the purpose of properly diagnosing them and then eventually treating them. Well, that's very impressive. And the next question is, what is treatment like with QEEG? How do you treat? Okay. <clears throat> what we do is, as you saw there, we find what location needs to be treated. We also find what frequencies are abnormally high and low. So for instance, you can still see the screen? Yes. Okay. For instance, this is another case of ADD. This theta beta ratio is 5.0. They have too much theta and or not enough beta. So we look to see in the details. Well, there is the theta. It's five, six, seven, eight hertz, and it's yellow and light orange. That means there's too much of it compared to his peer group. We need to train that down. For beta, it's blue. He doesn't have enough of it. So we need to train, in this case, 15 to 19 hertz up. Now, if you did this by textbook, the textbook would say theta is four to eight hertz, you need to train it down. And it would be approximately correct. But then it would say you got to train beta 12 to 18 hertz up. Well, he doesn't have a problem with 12, 13, 14 hertz. His problem starts at 15 and goes to 19. So we get the accurate frequencies that we need to train. The next thing is, we know where to treat because that's where the theta beta ratio was the highest. So we place an electrode on the brain at that location and we plug him into a computer. Then we program the computer to look for five to eight hertz and to look for 15 to 19 hertz and to separate that data out and present that to the patient in real time how much his brain is producing 
low frequencies and high frequencies. The goal here is to lower the low frequencies and to raise the good frequencies. Then, they play a video game. Now, this is a video game. It's an action game. This uh, cartoon will begin to juggle the balls when the theta gets lowered below a threshold. So the very first uh, bar graph, there is a goal. And if the brain activity is operating below the goal, it turns green and the figure begins to juggle the balls. Now we want them to do something else. While that's going on, for every half second that they continue to juggle, they get a point. So points are gained when they are below the threshold. Now, we need to do a second thing. We need to increase the beta. By increasing the beta, we set another goal for the 15 to 19 hertz range. And if it's below the threshold, as it's indicated there, it's red. It turns red. As soon as the brain increases and goes above the threshold, the bar will turn green and the music will play. They will have headphones on and they would hear the music. Now this is being done in real time so that if the brain goes back to the old pattern, it'll drop below the threshold and the music stops. So the music goes on and off and on and off and on and off. Well, that's annoying. Annoying is good because the brain does not like annoying and it figures out how do I keep this music playing? Then it realizes that if it increases good beta, oh, the music continues to play. The screen reports the percent of a time that the music is playing versus silence. So we use those figures to make sure that the person is being rewarded about three quarters of the time. If they fall below 60%, it's not enough reward for the brain to learn what it can do to achieve its goal. If it gets up to 85, 90%, it's so easy to achieve the goal. The brain doesn't have to change very much. We want the brain to change because the normal pattern is running too much theta and not enough beta. We continue to do this repeatedly twice a week for 30 minutes and the brain learns a new pattern. Now brains are patterning, they run patterns. Okay? While it's running that pattern, it's not taking in information. If we go in and we alter its pattern, we reward it to learn a new pattern, it will learn that. And now there will be less slowing and more assimilation of information and the child will wanna pay attention because they're now getting it, they're learning. So that's the process. It's playing video games, which I have very few kids not willing to do and adults, we can entice the same way by making it a challenge. You did 1,500 points uh, last time. Well, let's see if you can make 1,600 this time. And they keep pushing their brain to alter its pattern. Once you learn a pattern, the brain will continue to run that pattern. So... In one of the interviews that I heard you do with a Dr. Corey, one of the things you talked about was some of the research about how how this the effects last. And there was some research <clears throat> comparing uh, the benefits of um, medications for these same kinds of issues compared to the benefits side effects and long and, and lasting benefits from the QEEG neurofeedback. What can you tell us about that? Okay, Medic the, the brain is a, a electrical chemical engine. 
Psychiatry prefers to treat it as a chemical engine. What we are doing here is we're treating it as if it's an electrical engine. The fact remains, it is a electrical chemical engine. Now, the brain is a pattern engine, as I've said, and it learns patterns. It will continue to run those patterns until it learns a different pattern. Psychiatry goes in and it alters the chemical, the neurochemicals in the brain. That affects the way the brain operates. When that happens, the brain will offset some deficiencies and the symptoms will remediate. However, if you discontinue the chemicals, since you did not train the brain to produce those chemicals, but rather injected them uh, through uh, taking some type of medication, if you remove that medication, the brain goes back to its old pattern and the symptoms come back. Now, when we do this through electrical training, where we're training the brain as if it's an electrical engine and we are rewarding it, this is the same process that parents use all the time when they try to teach their, their um, young children how to balance themselves on a two-wheeler bicycle. Now, you cannot tell them what to do. You tell them to steer and to pedal, but that only keeps them from hitting trees. You can't tell them how to balance themselves. They have to try it. And you have to be there to catch them or otherwise they'll fall. The brain doesn't like to fall. So it's very highly uh, motivated to stay on those two skinny wheels. And they have to practice over and over again because they will wobble and, and almost fall and someone will catch them and put them back on the uh, centering over the wheels and they will go a little further and they'll try to fall again and you'll catch them. And they keep practicing. And the brain is learning how to keep its center of gravity directly over those two skinny wheels. Once the brain learns that, it has learned a new pattern. Now, I tell parents, can you ride a bicycle? Most of them can. I said, how long has it been since you rode a bicycle? I get various answers. Last week, two months ago, two years ago, sometimes five years ago. I said, if you get on a bike this afternoon, do you think you would remember how to balance yourself? Everybody says yes, because they have in fact done that at one time or another. Because the brain was trained, it learned a pattern. They might be wobbly the first hundred yards, but after that, the brain kicks in and says, oh, I know how to do this. I can keep my center of gravity over those two wheels. That way, you can withdraw the training because you've trained the brain. And now, it will last about as long as you remember how to balance yourself on a two-wheel bicycle. Well, it's a wonderful analogy. I, I, I see a potential benefit here for quite a few people, not just for those for whom the medications are not helping at all, but for those where the medication helps, but it has unpleasant side effects and or, um, you know, like, like the cost of some of these medications is a burden for some people. Yes. So it's, it, it seems as though what you're doing is more facilitating growth and healing rather than just treating symptoms. Yes. And we take advantage of the fact that the brain is a pattern engine. It learns patterns and it continues to run those patterns. I tell people the brain only knows two things and it's not good or bad. That is a higher level moral function you have to develop. The brain knows familiar and unfamiliar, and it does not like unfamiliar. So it gravitates always back to the familiar, whether or not it's good for you. So we wanna train it to have a healthier pattern, a more productive pattern. And with that, the brain will continue to run that pattern and people will have less need of medication, not have the side effects of that and be able to perform. One good example 
is um, Lucas Giolato is the pitcher for the Chicago White Sox. Last year, he was the worst pitcher in the major leagues. He says his problem was lack of focus. Couldn't concentrate. Couldn't hold the focus long enough. So he began doing neurofeedback. And he did neurofeedback all through the offseason. This year, it's a totally different story. He can maintain his focus. And he became the leading pitcher in the American League and was the starting pitcher for the All-Star game. In one year, his performance completely changed because he trained his brain. And now he can maintain the focus that he needs to do the job that he enjoys doing. So the question comes to my mind, what's the range of things that can be helped with the QEEG neurofeedback? Well, it's most psychiatric uh, conditions. We can treat depression. We can treat anxiety. We can treat obsession, compulsion, which is another example. Uh, psychiatry calls it obsessive compulsive disorder. If they were to look at the brain, they would know that it's two different disorders. If you have high beta activity in the left frontal region, you will have obsessive thoughts, racing thoughts, ruminating thoughts, can't turn your mind off. If you have high beta activity in the posterior right side of the brain, you will develop compulsive activities, be a perfectionist, have to do it again and again and again to get it exactly right. Only if you have high beta activity in the left frontal and the right posterior do you have obsessive compulsive disorder? It's two different disorders. We can, we can treat that. Uh, certainly the ADD. We see a lot of um, learning disabilities, which is, in, which is interference with high amplitude, low frequency. We can train that down, and the child no longer gets distracted or uh, disrupted in their thought processes. So they finish tasks that they start. They can do sequences of steps, which they couldn't do before. Okay? So we have that. We can see people who have inabilities to find the right words or construct an effective uh, sentences for writing or speaking. All of that is on the left side of the brain. The words are selected from the front left side of the brain in Broca's area. And language is assembled in Wernicke's area in the left posterior part of the brain. We will often find high amplitude low frequencies or high amplitude high frequencies that disrupt that processing. If we can train that down, then we have effectively removed the distractors that has interfered with their ability to find the right words, construct sentences, and, and think. So just about any. Now, which ones can't we treat? The brain certainly um, can fall into a condition of malfunction in terms of psychosis. Psychosis is a much more complicated thing. It is effectively treated with medication. And although we can remove some symptoms, such as paranoia, we can reduce paranoia in paranoid schizophrenia. We can't effectively stop or change uh, schizophrenia itself. So there's a few things like that that we can't. We can help memory, but again, it depends on what's causing the memory problem. Uh, I've treated five patients who feared they were having uh, the beginnings of dementia. Sure enough, they had high amplitude, low frequencies in the area of retrieving memories, short-term memories. We train that down and all of them reported that they now believe their memory is as good as it's ever been. One person in particular, I did a one-year and a two-year follow-up 
and all of the problems were no longer showing up in the QEEG, and they did not have any recurrence of symptoms. So we know that we pushed back this degrading de- uh, de- of memory at least two years. So is it possible to be uh, getting treatment with QEEG neurofeedback if you're already on a medication for a problem? Yes. <clears throat> we do not take people off of their medications when they come for treatment. Now, there's a couple exceptions. However, most medications, they can learn to train their brain while they're on the medication. Then when we get good results, we can show it to the psychiatrist or physician and ask them to begin to wean them off the medication so that they can uh, pick up that responsibility of performing the brain functions necessary to do what they wish to do or offset the symptoms that they had. In this chart is how we track our performance. This was a person we were training with anxiety. As you see, this is the average amount of high beta activity their brain was producing. In the first 20 sessions, it was pretty much out of control. It was going extremely high, extremely low. Over time, and it took about almost 40 sessions, you can see how the high beta activity was suppressed. During that time, they report less anxiety. We wanted to make sure, are they doing this? Are they learning how to control their brain? So for every one of those averages, there is a variance of how much their brain went up and below the average. That would indicate how well they are learning to control their brain activity. So we plot the variance which is the standard deviation. Before, the standard deviation was very high and very irregular. Over time, it also began to decrease to where we were getting uh, several points below four standard deviations from the mean, which for high beta activity is approximately uh, what enables the person to control their brain waves so they no longer feel anxious. So we track this to about 40 sessions again, and their brain learns how to do that. And then when that happens, they work with their psychiatrist to decide whether or not they need as much medication. Is that the implication? That's correct. We have quantified the data here to prove to the psychiatrist that their brain is picking up dysfunction, and they no longer need as much medication or medication at all. I find that most psychiatrists really do want to take people off of medication because they know it's a toxin to the body. Many of your drug commercials will tell you and warn you about uh, liver conditions because anything you ingest, if it's a toxin, your liver has got to take it out of your system. And if you continue to do this for many years, then you will damage your liver. It will not be able to continue serving you for a a length of your lifespan. So they do want to take them off, but they don't have justification to do that. This provides the justification. Wonderful. So what can you tell us about studies about what percentage of people with these problems respond positively to the QEEG neurofeedback? All right, that's a good question. Uh, This is a summary of the kind of successes that have been documented by professional societies like the International Society of Neurofeedback and Research. The first one was Margaret Ayers. Margaret Ayers was a pioneer in this field. She was a neurologist. She said she did neurofeedback with her patients and found better than 90% complete or nearly complete relief of symptoms. 
Next is Joe Lubar, the man that I studied with. He was the one who found the theta-beta ratio for ADD. He said he gets better than 90% have gained substantially by doing the neurofeedback training. Mike and Linda Thompson. Uh, Mike Thompson is a neurologist. Linda Thompson is a clinical psychologist. They have a general practice in Canada. They find between 80 to 90% success rate in relieving the symptoms of the patients that come to visit their office. Dr. Rotman, I do not know. Uh, he treats uh, people with fetal alcohol syndrome and autism. For three years, myself and a colleague were uh, treating fetal alcohol syndrome and doing research and presented at three different conferences on our results with some very impressive res uh, successes. I have a number of autistic children that come because autism is, again, characteristic by high amplitude, low frequencies, which is a distracting brainwave. They start doing something and they get distracted and they do something else and they don't stay focused. Those tend to be my longer term patients, but the parents keep bringing them because they see incremental improvements. One mother says, oh yes, we can. he now sits at the dinner table for the entire meal when we eat. Continued bringing them and reported, oh, now when the family watches a movie, he watches the entire movie with them. So they see these incremental improvements and they continue wanting to build on that. Uh, Siegfried Atmer, again, he's a, a Canadian uh, neurotherapist. He's formerly a um, physicist. Uh, he also went through a, a uh, metamorphosis of uh, careers and got out of um, physics and into neurofeedback. He reports out of 1,000 cases, 20% are miracle stories. Unbelievable. 45% improved substantially and relief of all the symptoms, and 25% are satisfied that they have achieved the goals that they came in for. All of that is documented in a wonderful book called Symphony in the Brain. It's by Jim Robbins, and it, it's a layperson's explanation of neurofeedback and a history of how we got started in doing this. and. Um, what the new technology is affording us to be able to do. Wonderful, thank you for that overview. Well, as we wind down our time here, let me ask, what's an area that we, I haven't asked you about yet that you'd like our audience to learn of or to know about what you do? Well, first of all, when they go and have a set of symptoms that is causing problems either in the family or for their loved one, and they go to the medical community and they begin to experiment and try different medications and they do not seem to be working or they have side effects that they can't live with, not to give up hope because that is just the view of treating the brain as if it's a chemical engine. There's another approach, an alternative approach of treating the brain as if it's an electrical engine. And that may very well serve them to get the kind of success they want to have and not to be discouraged because treating it as a chemical engine did not work. Um, they've David Burns is a psychiatrist. Uh, he's famous. He wrote the book Feeling Good and, and a number of other books. Uh, he was here in Lyle, Illinois, teaching and had an audience of 250 therapists in DuPage County. Early in his program, he made the statement, psychiatry will make no further advances until they stop treating the brain as if it's a chemical engine and begin treating it as if it's an electrical engine. Well, I could have stood up and applauded because that's exactly what I do. And I believe he is right because we have 
given parents hope when they were at the end of their rope, not being able to take medications and thinking that there was no other help for their child. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, you're located in Naperville, and I'm assuming you don't work alone. Who's on your team there in Naperville? Okay, I have um, four neuro neurotherapists here. I have two clinical psychologists. One of them does all of our EEGs. Another one uh, does more of the advanced <clears throat> types of neurofeedback as well as being a neuropsychologist, and he can do uh, typical uh, neuropsych testing. However, we have the advantage of doing the traditional neuropsych testing and combine the information and validate it with QEEG data. So we do that. Um, we treat 172 patients a week. We have the most complete neurofeedback laboratory in the entire Chicago area. Not only do we have the best EEG equipment in every hospital around here, and I know that because I get the EEGs from hospitals around here, and I'm not impressed, but hospitals do not spend a lot of money on EEG equipment. They only care about whether or not you're having a seizure, and if they buy mediocre equipment, it will very well tell you if you're having a seizure. And they spend their money on MRI machines and the real big ticket items like the fusion tensor imaging machines and so on. So um, that's the way we gather our data. Then when it comes to treatment, we have five different types of neurofeedback technologies to apply. Each of these technologies kind of have its strengths and its weaknesses. So once we see what the goal is and what we need to change, I have five different types of computer technologies to apply. And there's no one in Chicago who's got five. When I belong to eegchicago.com, we are 10 highly certified neurotherapists th throughout the Chicago area, and we have the most complete laboratory. And we're out here in the western suburbs. Wonderful, wonderful. And what's your website before we close this out? It's www.ultimatebrain.com. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today and, uh, and for the work that you do. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to our next contact. Very good. Thank you for this opportunity. I enjoyed it. And I'd like to help disseminate this information to more and more people. And we give a free information seminar first Friday of the month, which will be next Friday, September 6th at 7 p.m. here at our office in Naperville. We have a large conference room. We can seat 60 people. So we invite people. There. It's free and there's no obligation to come and hear more details about how neurofeedback can change your life. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening. 